Hello, my name is William Cross and I'm a PhD student at Bart's Cancer Institute and I work under the supervision of Trevor Graham. Today we're going to talk about DNA sequencing. Now the purpose of DNA sequencing is to reveal the nucleotide order within a DNA segment. Today we're going to be sequencing the APC gene. The APC gene is associated with colorectal cancer. So we've got a piece of colorectal tissue and we can sequence this and discover if there are any somatic mutations that may have caused this patient's disease. Before we get anything in the lab, the first thing we need to do is put our lab coat on. There are two reasons why we wear a lab coat. One of them is to protect the experiment, but the other one is to actually protect ourselves. Another thing we need to do is to put gloves on, and we also need to clean the desk with ethanol. Wearing a lab coat prevents us from introducing contamination from our clothes and the gloves prevent our own DNA from getting into the reaction. Before we begin, I'd just like to give you a little introduction to Sanger sequencing. So Sanger sequencing was invented in 1977 by Frederick Sanger and it was invented in Cambridge, UK. And it's become the gold standard for sequencing. The reason for that is because it's cost effective and it's very easy to perform. Now, it has been since superseded by other techniques, such as next-generation sequencing, but these are far more expensive to do, and the scales of the experiment are larger. So for today, we're going to talk about Sanger sequencing. Now, Sanger sequencing is based on PCR, which is the first step of this procedure that we need to perform. But before we do that, let's just talk about the DNA and where we acquire that from. This patient who had colorectal cancer has got slides that have been sectioned by the pathologists, but we also have available frozen tissue and it's this piece of frozen tissue that we can use to extract the DNA and then perform the sequencing on the region of interest. From this patient's genomic DNA we can now perform the PCR reaction. Now this genomic DNA contains the entire complement of the human genome but we are only looking at the APC gene today which is why we need to perform PCR to amplify the region of interest that we want to sequence. To perform a PCR, we need to use several reagents. And the first one is TAC polymerase. TAC polymerase is the key enzyme that amplifies DNA, which is why we keep it on ice. The second thing we need are primers. Now, primers specify the exact region of the genomic DNA that we want to amplify. So in this case, we've got primers that target APC. The third thing we need is buffer. Now, buffer is really important to optimize the PCR and ensure that the primers bind optimally. The fourth thing we need is DNTPs. Using all of these reagents and our genomic DNA that we start with, we can now produce our PCR reaction. This is our PCR reaction tube. And this is our PCR tubes that will go onto the thermocycler. Now, the first thing to do is add our genomic DNA and our control. Now, we're adding in water to tube number one, as this is our control. And we're adding our genomic DNA into reaction well number two. Now, to make up our reaction mix, we need to use our tank. Then we need to add our primers. That was the forward primer. Now we need to do the reverse primer because primers always come in pairs. Now we need to add our buffer. And the buffer may depend on what your reaction has been optimized to. And then the last part of our reaction is the DNTPs. Now we can aliquot this reaction 
into both of our tubes, our control and our genomic DNA tube. And we're now ready for thermocycling. Now we have our PCR reaction set up and ready to go, we can put it onto the thermocycler. An important thing to note here is that while this machine thermal cycles, it amplifies the DNA, but the enzyme that we've used here, which is TAC, Thermo Aquaticus, is thermostable. So it's important to note that this enzyme will not be degraded by the thermocycling. The programme itself runs through 30 cycles, each with three stages. The first stage is denaturation, where the DNA molecules are separated. The second stage is annealing, which is where our primers bind to the region of interest within this DNA molecule. And the third stage is extension, where the TAC polymerase amplifies the DNA molecules and incorporates the new DNTPs. Before we actually do the sequencing, we need to check that this reaction has worked. Now, electrophoresis uses a gel bed like this one here. And what we essentially do is add some PCR product to this gel and run it through an electrode. The electrical current that will pass through this gel attracts DNA molecules. The DNA that starts off in the well will gravitate towards the positive end as DNA is negatively charged. And as it passes through this gel, this gel contains ethidium bromide and that will bind to the DNA. We can then visualise the DNA under a UV light. Alongside the PCR product, we need to run a DNA ladder, and the DNA ladder enables us to size the DNA fragment. So we know what size we're expecting this APC fragment to be, so this is another way of checking. In order to load the PCR product onto this gel, we need to use loading buffer. Loading buffer contains glycerol, and glycerol pulls the PCR product to the bottom of the well rather than float out. So now we need to load our PCR reactions into the gel. So that was our negative control. And now for our PCR with the PCR product, the APCG. And we also need to add a small amount of ladder. And the ladder will enable us to size. We can use this apparatus to pass a current through the gel. And we can leave this for around half an hour at 90 volts. And here we show the results of the gel run, where the DNA has run from the top of the gel to the bottom. On the left-hand well, we can see the DNA ladder we can see our PCR product, and this has run down to the size of 120 base pairs, as expected. Next to the PCR product, we can actually see our negative control, which should be blank. Now we have our PCR product, and we've checked that the reaction worked, we can perform the Sanger sequencing. We can actually use a very similar mix to what we used for our PCR step. This time, however, we need to incorporate big dye terminator DNTPs. These have got bound to them a fluorescent dye and it's this fluorescent dye that can be picked up by the genetic analyzer that we're going to load this onto later. This reaction uses the same PCR primers that we used earlier, the APC primers. It uses a buffer the same and it uses TAC polymerase the same. So all we need to do is actually produce our mix the same as before and use five microliters of our PCR product we can run this on the thermocycler as we did previous. However, the reaction conditions are slightly different because we're incorporating big dyes, we're incorporating fluorescent nucleotides this time. The Sanger sequencing reaction is similar to conventional PCR. We have denaturation, annealing and extension stages as before. However, during each cycle, a di deoxynucleotide is incorporated randomly terminating the extension stage at that point. This happens during each cycle of the Sanger sequencing reaction, and these dideoxynucleotides have a fluorescent tag that can be detected by 
the genetic analyzer. The result of this process is sequencing products of varying size with a fluorescently tagged nucleotide incorporated at the last base of the fragment. The final step of this process is to clean up this sequencing reaction using two enzymes, exonuclease and shrimp alkali phosphatase. Once our cleanup reaction has finished, we can now load our sequencing reaction onto the genetic analyzer. The machine is able to sort our PCR products by size, with the smallest fragment corresponding to the first nucleotide being recorded first. The detection is performed using a high power laser, and each dideoxynucleotide has a specific color that corresponds to a particular nucleotide base. A detector records the base order as each fragment passes through. Once the sequencing has finished, an ABI file is generated that contains our sequencing data. This can be opened by software such as 4Peaks and it is summarised as a chromatogram or sequencing trace. The bases are read on the x-axis, left to right. We can output this information as a text file for further analysis. The y-axis in this trace represents the intensity of the fluorescence for each base that was detected by the machine. This can generally be used for quality checks. To look for mutations in this sequence, we can align our bases to the human genome using BLAST, the basic local alignment search tool, which is free to use on NCBI's website. Aligning our sequence identifies the APC gene as expected, and we can identify a single nucleotide mutation from the mismatch against the reference sequence. Looking back at the chromatogram confirms that this cancer had gained a mutation in the APC gene, which may have been important to the development of the disease. Sanger sequencing can be used to detect mutations in other genes that collectively can help us understand the causes of cancer. To summarise what we did today, we began with a DNA extraction from patient-derived tissue. Then we performed a PCR amplification of the gene of interest, which was APC in this case. Then we checked this PCR using Agro's gel electrophoresis. Then we performed our sequencing reaction and cleanup. Then we performed analysis of our sequencing results. So today we've performed Sanger sequencing, which is a really key technique in DNA experimentation, and I hope you found it helpful.